So welcome everybody. Um, there are three of us from AbilityNet on this call. Um, I'll get them to introduce themselves. My, I'm Mark Walker. I'm the head of marketing at comms. I'm going to be your host for today. Um, Abby, uh, Abby James, say hi, Abby. I can see. Hello. You. That's good. The technology's working. Uh, can you tell us a bit about yourself, Abby? What you do for AbilityNet? Hello, yes, so I'm an accessibility consultant with AbilityNet, so I do uh, testing, auditing sites, um, training for accessibility in various types of organisations, and I also, outside of AbilityNet, have links to university sector, having worked in them in the past, where I do research into accessibility and uh, standards as well. Great. Um, and uh, Addy, do you want to say hi? Yeah, hello everyone. This is Adi. Uh, I'm an accessibility consultant at AbilityNet also and uh, I do a lot of uh, awareness events uh, talking about digital accessibility and I'm a screen reader user uh, myself so um, I'm directly impacted by good um, accessible products. Cool. Um, somebody just asked about the text appearing along the bottom the captions um that is uh, orla who's also in, in the panelists she's typing as we go and that's a service that they provide from my clear text so uh it's not the built-in thing in zoom um so uh, i'm starting to get some questions coming in uh please do keep asking questions on the question box we're going to answer them as we go along uh, there's also plenty of time at the end for questions and answers the more questions you post in now obviously the better prepared we'll be later on um, we're going to be covering the Public Sector Bodies Websites and Mobile Applications Accessibility Regulations 2018. Uh, we're going to be talking about what accessibility is all about, in case you're not 100% sure about that. But we're mainly going to be looking at what the regulations say, who they affect, what do you need to do about them, and give you a chance for questions and answers at the end. Please do ask anything that you need to clarify as we go along, um, or drop in your questions um, and we'll just manage that. I'm do as host, that's the stuff I'm doing in the background. Addy and Abby will be talking to the slides. I'll just be making sure that we can hear um, your questions and, and try and answer them either as we go along or at the end. A little bit about AbilityNet in case you don't know much about us. We uh, are a charity, a UK based charity, and we provide a variety of services. We have the digital accessibility services, obviously most relevant today. Uh, we also work with universities and we do DSA assessments for students with disabilities to provide a, a inclusive uh, education services. Uh, we provide uh, assessments in the workplace to help disabled people um, be more productive in the workplace, particularly linked to access to work and uh, reasonable adjustments. We have a network of 300 volunteers who can go into people's homes and help disabled people. And we have a whole load of free advice and information resources we have a helpline you can call an 800 number. We have fact sheets and webinars. Um, that's relevant either to disabled people themselves or to the people who work with disabled people. Um, and uh, amongst the primary resources, My Computer My Way will tell you all the accessibility features in all the mainstream uh, operating systems, and that's available for free as well. We do a load of events. TechShare Pro is our annual accessibility uh, event. We're running that with RNIB. It's hosted by Google this year. Um, in November. Uh, we do the Tech for Good Awards. Entries close next Friday. Get your entries in before next Friday, please. Uh, we do an IT volunteer conference. We, bring, we work with RNIB and other charities uh, to bring volunteers who work with IT together. We do tech demo days, which may be relevant to you on this call. We, they're primarily looking at tech in an education setting, and they just show some of the latest technology and give people a chance to talk about their needs. And we also do a range of accessibility workshops and webinars and, and other training based activities. So I'm going to run a poll. I would like to know who's here. I'm going to ask you a couple of questions and uh, also just make sure that the, that, the, um, that the software is working. So can you see the poll? Um, hopefully you can. If you can't see the poll, just mention it in the chat box. There could be, oh yeah, great, it's working. So I just want to know where you're from. Uh, it's, it's according to the sort of sector that you're from at the moment. There'll be a couple more questions in a little bit, little bit about other things, but how would you describe your accessibility knowledge and what is your role? Just so that we've got a, some sense of how to pitch the, the presentation that we're doing. Um, I'm also looking at, if you've mentioned it in chat, project managing a website redevelopment project in a higher education institution, um, user researcher, uh, what else have we got in here? A digital publishing manager at NICE. Um, we're from a government arm's length body. Uh, project manager. 
Um, it, all of your audio is muted, yes. <laughs> um, for that, that person who was worried about the background sound, uh, please do use the text uh, specifically for that reason. Um, user researcher in government, learning technologist, project manager, quality advisor. Um, so a great mix, disability service manager and HE. So uh, I'm going to end the poll and let you see uh, what people have answered. Um, and then you'll just get a sense of the range of people who are um, on, the, on the call with us. Um, uh, mainly education and FE, that's a principal audience for us in our sense at the moment in terms of focusing on that. Although, of course, the regulations certainly apply much more broadly than that. Uh, half of you have said you know a reasonable amount of accessibility, about accessibility, so that's good because we'll make that assumption that we don't need to delve too deep into the, the basic background of accessibility. Um, and the largest number of people who've replied with anything specific have got a role in terms of content, which I guess means we'll be thinking about how you make accessible content available and some of the challenges of doing that. Great, so uh, thanks very much for all of that. That gives us a great place to start. Um, Let's move on then. And um, Adi, you're going to tell us a little bit about why digital accessibility is important, bearing in mind that 50% of people said they know a fair bit about it. Lovely. Thank, thanks, Mark. Um, sure. Um, so for people who aren't that aware of it, digital accessibility is um, designing your digital content in, a, in such a way that um, it can be accessed by, by anybody regardless uh, of a disability. Uh, your content can be a website, it can be an app, um, or it can be a document such as a PDF document, a PowerPoint, or, or an Office Word file. Why is it important? Well, it provides an opportunity for a person with a disability to integrate with the world, to live a life where they can be the best, um, to operate effectively, just like anyone else. So doing activities such as online grocery shopping, paying bills, renewing the TV license, etc., um, and accessing university materials and doing online exams. So if you design a website or an app um, that's accessible, then you're directly contributing to uh, a person's independence, a person who has a disability to their independence. And conversely, if you don't um, design your, your product accessibly, you're, you're taking away um, some potential independence. Um, and myself, um, when I was at when I was at school, um, this is how old I am. People still use paper books, and uh, and being blind, it was very difficult for me um, to be independent at school. So I would have people read my books to me, and people, you know, would write my exams for me. But nowadays, in this digital first world, um, I'm able to read electronic books all by myself. Um, usually, even faster than uh, my sighted peers. And I'm able to do online exams uh, all by myself. So the level of independence has is, is gone up, and that's just through to good technology and, and the use of a screen reading um, software that I use that reads the screen to me. Um, however, um, screen readers and other assistive technologies um, come across barriers on a, on a daily basis um, because of accessibility issues. So if you look at some of the common accessibility issues, we have things such as headings not marked up um, correctly on a page. Head headings should be used to indicate the hierarchy of a page, and the size and look of a heading should not should not um, be uh, related to the heading level. Um, color contrast is a common issue that we come across, and if the color contrast is bad, then it makes it really difficult for people with low vision uh, to, to read your content. And also um, for everyone else, if you're, um, for example, if you're using your mobile phone in, in a different environment, for example, if there's a lot of sun, you won't be able to see the, the screen that well. Um, we, we talk a lot about missing alt descriptions on graphics, so people who can't see a picture um, having a, a relevant alt um, description on that or on any buttons that, that, um, that require a, a description. Um, some people aren't able to use the mouse, so being able to navigate um, your website, for example, using the keyboard only, that's, that's a really important um, uh, um, factor that you should take into account, and that's a quite common issue that we come across. Um, forms not being accessible, and a variety of issues can happen here where you know, the, the label of the form is not connected to the field, for example, um, or the error messages aren't useful um, when, when they come up on the page. 
Um, and for, for multimedia content, uh, not having captions on your multimedia content makes it difficult for someone who's hard of hearing to follow the content. Um, and not having an audio description, which um, for people who don't know, audio description is a, it's an audio track that describes the visuals that are happening in, in, in a video clip that, that, um, that helps people who are blind. And having a transcript is, is very useful for, for, for many people, especially for people who are deafblind. So how can you check accessibility? Um, the combination of uh, automated and manual tests are, is, is the best way of doing it. Um, an automated tool can't um, give you 100% accessibility um, uh, guarantee of your website. We'd say it's a 50-50, it's a balance. So for example, um, a tool, an automated tool would identify all the graphics on your page that don't have an alt text. However, it would be down to a real human being to um, um, create the alt text and create meaningful um, alt text. There you go. There was a quick run through of digital accessibility. Great. Thank you, Addy. Um, and just to clarify, we, we know we're not expecting uh, people to have an in-depth knowledge of accessibility for the rest of this conversation, but we do think it's useful for you to have um, at least a primer there. Um, and there are, obviously there's an awful lot more to, to uh, accessibility than, than we've covered in that brief overview, but hopefully that's given you a little bit of a starting block for those who hadn't heard of any of this before. Um, so uh, we're going to go over to you, Abby, and you're going to tell us a lot more about the actual legislation, who it applies to, what it's got in it. Yes, I get the boring bit to talk about the law. <laughs> um, and, and I know um, I'm, I can already see from the questions coming up that some people are aware of the regulations and already thinking in depth. So I'm going to try and answer some of the questions that I can already see come up as we're going through. Um, but for those of you who aren't familiar with it, give you the real basics as well to give you a good feel of what's required. So we're talking about the public sector bodies, websites and mobile applications accessibility regulations 2018. And this set of regulations came out of an EU directive. So some of the wording which are in the regulations don't necessarily match what we're used to within the Equality Act because we've taken on those European definitions. But this is now UK law. It's not going away. It's with us. Um, and it has three requirements, which I will go through. One is related to meeting accessibility standards. The second is to do with producing accessibility statements. And the third is to do with monitoring um, and compliance with the regulations. So moving on. Uh, the regulations apply to all publicly funded organisations. Now, there's no definition of what that is within the regulations, but it takes on the same definition as uh, the EU use within procurement uh, re regulations. So if you are an organisation where you have to go out to tender for procurement because of EU directives, basically you're also considered under that same definition. There are a few exceptions. One is non-government organisations like charities, unless they provide essential public services or aimed at public disabled people. The second big exemption is schools or nurseries, except for the content the public needs to use in their services. Now, um, we're talking to DfE at the moment about clarification on that, um, because the public means parents and pupils, and what their services are needs a bit more definition, but we can assume that things like statutory information that must be published on a school's website is something that um, the public are expected to, to access. And then public service broadcasters are exempt at the moment as well. And the government estimates this means it will cover about 44,000 websites in the UK. Now, I want to be clear about the exceptions here because people aren't sure where they lie. Well, this still doesn't affect our own responsibilities under the Equality Act. And really these regulations need to be thought of as the technical structure to ensure that you are providing a website or digital content that isn't indirectly discriminating against disabled people. So this is really about how to make sure you're not falling foul of the Equality Act. Even if you think you are exempt, you still have those Equality Act um, responsibilities. So moving on. So timeline, there is a stepped process for these regulations. Um, first of all, it's all, the clock is already ticking. 
uh, websites that were published uh, since last September or substantially revised. Again, there's no formal definition of what that means, but if you have changed your designs, changed the look and feel of a website or substantially changed the content, then that could be considered a new website since September last year. That must conform to accessibility standards by this September and also by this September existing intranets and extranets would also have to um, comply and content going up after this September on those intranets and extranets. And because intranets and extranets are included in the regulations, we must understand that the regulations aren't just about public websites, they're about any digital systems that could be used within the public sector organisation. So it's about what you provide to staff and your uh, stakeholders within your digital estate as well. The new websites have to sorry, existing websites have to comply by September 2020. So by September 2020, any website content, Ooh. apart from some exemptions, sorry if we can go back, sorry. will um, have to comply with the accessibility standards. And then if you're an organization that po publishes a native mobile application, so on through Google Play or through the Apple iPhone store, then that must comply by June 2021. So there is quite a strict timeline for this. So what do we mean by these accessibility standards? Um, the can next I, sorry, can I just ask a question, yeah. Abby? There's just something coming, because I know, I know we're going to come on to this potentially sure. later, but just this thing about who it applies to. I can just mm. see a couple of questions in here. Somebody just asked about a parish council, yes. and then there's this question about charities. I think, could you just clarify again, you know, that somehow there's a connection in there, or also these are good standards to be aiming for in terms of the Quality Act as well? Yeah, this, so, the, so in terms of charities, um, the... If you are a charity is aimed at disabled people, then you are covered by potentially covered by the regulations. Um, if you have a wider remit, then you may not be. But essentially, within the Equality Act, if you are providing any services, then you are you have to make sure that you are not discriminating against a disabled person. And the advice uh, that we have on web accessibility in terms of the Equality Act is that you must make reasonable adjustments to ensure that your website is accessible and if you don't then you may be discriminating against people who are trying to access your services. So while um, accessibility standards aren't specifically defined within the Equality Act you still have some responsibility to make sure that your services can be accessed by disabled people. Okay and another question about what it covers is um, to do with the definition of what what type of material? Sorry, I'm just looking for the so question. I'm going to come on to that in the next few slides. Okay. So let's, let's right. leave that let's, one. Let's keep going so on that one. Keep going. So in terms of what do we mean by accessibility standards? Um, many of you have said you're, you're familiar with accessibility and you might have heard of a standard called the Web Content Accessibility Guidelines 2.0 or WCAG. We shorten it to WCAG. The standard referred to in these regulations is a European standard, which is catchily named EN301549. But this has been aligned to the latest version of WCAG 2.1, which was published last year. So the standard that we have to work to is WCAG 2.1 level AA, which is incorporated into EN301549. The important thing to note with this standard also it doesn't just cover websites it's actually a standard that was developed for procurement for ICT so it covers everything from desks and ergonomics and kiosks but in terms of the regulations it covers websites it covers documents and it covers applications so there are three sections that apply to these regulations whereas we've thought of WCAG before solely for websites this regulations and standard covers documents and apps as well. And we have these standards to make sure that tools, assistive technology and personalization will work across all platforms. They're developed by experts across the world, so they are used widely internationally. And they provide statements that we can check against to ensure that the site will work as well as we hope. So, for example, we have things like making sure that keyboard functionality works across all aspects of the site, color contrast works, but then it can be quite technical in terms of making sure that a button um, has a role assigned to it so that Addy and other screen reader users know that when they get to it, they hear that it's a button. So some of it can be quite technical in, um, in nature as well. I noticed there was a question somebody asked about how do we build this into procurement? Well, actually this standard was 
designed for procurement so it's a really good thing to refer back to because it is written in a way to use for requirements as part of a procurement process so moving on we do to the next slide so we do have some exclusions in terms of the type of content we get that are covered first of all about downloadable documents it doesn't apply to documents from before the regulations from before september 2018 unless they're in active use now particularly if you're in the context of higher education if you've got content that was created for students who a couple of years ago but they're still actively using it then you might have to consider whether it's covered under the regulations likewise if you have a form or you have a prospectus or brochure that's still being actively used then that could be covered by the regulations in terms of uh, media pre-recorded media um, if that was pu isn't published before 2020 it's not so published before 2020 is not covered so you have to think about videos and audio after September 2020 live video is always exempt but as soon as you actually save that video and put it on your website it starts to be considered pre-recorded media and I did have a quick check at the document from the EU and they say that 14 days is the principle they would apply between it becoming live to pre-recorded so that's the sort of working time frame you have um, if you're broadcasting to put captions on to add descriptions create a transcript etc online maps again are excluded but you do have to provide an alternative um, form of navigation information if that is what it's being provided for so in all these senses it's about if you can't make it accessible <coughs> making sure somebody can access an alternative format very easily the one of the um, critical parts for the regulations is third party content is only excluded if you are not in control so the example we have for that is things like social media plugins where you have a twitter feed appearing on your website that's third party content but you have no control over what's going into that content however if you have a system that you have purchased um, for example in universities where we have library systems or accommodation booking systems or somebody is using a form plugin they're using something to create a form on a website as part of in the, in the local government for situation then that would be considered under your control so the public sector has responsibility for making sure that that does meet accessibility guidelines and this is where you need to build in these regulations into procurement processes um, both if you are getting third parties to develop for you or you are purchasing in a system as well and the other aspect again is archived websites archived materials um, are not necessarily covered there are further more um, exclusions as well and there's some links at the end of the slides where you can go and get some more details can i just ask a question there uh, sure? uh, maybe there was somebody saying how is active defined i'm just thinking this crosses <laughs> over with archived um for example again. archived courses from three years yeah. ago in the vle which aren't used in current teaching but students still have access to is that an archive yeah. Absolutely. I think with all these cases, particularly in this situation with universities, you've got to think about it in the context of the Equality Act as well. Um, those are students, they're your students, you're going to have to support them. Um, that might not be the priority to go back and make those courses accessible, but uh, going forward, you should consider that if you expect that student to have access to that material, and that's the, that's the expectation, then it should be accessible. Um, going forward as well so um, it's about having that conversation and deciding if you haven't got the resources to go back then what alternatives are you going to provide if students do need to have an accessible alternative um, and uh, you need to have a plan really okay yep. So this comes under this part as well which there is also uh, a mechanism that if you have content that is very complex or very difficult to make accessible or um, you consider that it, there's a disproportionate burden in terms of the technical time required to make it accessible there is something called disproportionate burden um, again the wording is different to the Equality Act but it's that same concept of reasonableness comes in but if you decide that that some of your content is could be a disproportionate burden you do have to go through a process you have to perform an initial assessment of the extent to which the compliance with the accessibility requirement imposes a dis 
proportionate burden, taking in account, into account the size and resources of your organisation, costs and benefits to people with disability, and taking into account the use of the app website or document. So this is where if you had, a, for example, a course of very few students, you may consider that as long as there is a route for them to get an accessible alternative, a disproportionate burden could be claimed. However, if you decide to go down that process, that must be included within your accessibility statement. So that does have to be publicly stated that you have gone down that. There's no let out of just leaving it. And again, um, the UK government have made clear that lack of time isn't a, a good reason uh, to claim disproportionate benefit. So the final responsibility on, on public sector organisations is to publish an accessibility statement. Uh, one of the questions I've had frequently is how many accessibility statements? Is it just one um, for the organisation? Well, from, a, from an accessibility testing point of view, we can go through a number of websites and systems within an organisation and the accessibility is completely different on each one because technically the back end is very different or they've been developed on by different people, different types of content. So you need to be able to, to bring together information that is um, coherent about the platform that it's on. So you might want to consider having separate accessibility system statements on different systems. Within that accessibility statement, you have to have certain bits of knowledge. One is an evaluation of the accessibility of the site and how much you comply. Um, you can claim fully compliant, partially compliant, or not compliant. And if something is partially or not, you have to say which parts of your service do not meet accessibility standards and why, with the intention of what you're going to do about that, providing alternatives to content that's not accessible. So many people have asked about captions on videos. If you haven't got captions on videos, you're going to have to put it in your accessibility statement, say why and what you're going to do about it um, and where the ac accessible alternatives are. So it's very much about planning for that process of not necessarily fully meeting um, accessibility standards. The accessibility standards are hard to conform to 100%. We all know that, um, but this is as much about a journey towards improving accessibility um, as much as saying, tick, we've done it. Um, the other two bits of information that must be on an accessibility statement is how to contact uh, the organisation to purport problems and a link to the government if that is not resolved. I think the key thing to remember with accessibility statements is this is an opportunity to communicate to your users about how you can support their access needs. So for example, um, it means that if somebody is coming to you, they know straight away what they can do and what they can't do without struggling through and, and missing parts of important information. Okay. Moving on. So the final part um, is the monitoring and that's the responsibility of the government and the cabinet office will be doing that. They have to sample a proportion of sites each year and the, who they sample will be based on advice from stakeholder groups and also complaints they receive as well. Um, so that will also be across different sectors and different sizes of organisation. So there will be some monitoring but that is very much about encouraging people to improve their accessibility uh, and move forward um, in what you can do. I think the big things to remember is it's if you're not complying is if you haven't got an accessibility statement it's very clear that you haven't done anything about the regulations and if somebody does point out accessibility difficulties to you that that could again lead you to be included in that sample at a higher rate. The Equality and Human Rights uh, Commission are responsible for enforcing the regulations as well so if there are problems that aren't resolved, potentially it could be escalated to the EHRC as well, um, which would then come under an Equality Act issue. Um, yeah. Just to clarify then, is, I know you've been party to some of the conversations, is it clear what the penalties will be for non-compliance? Uh, so there aren't any financial penalties specifically re related to the regulations. Um, I, I understand the Cabinet Office have some sort of naming and shaming, uh, um, particularly around whether there are accessibility statements. Um, provided they are responsible for ensuring that the accessibility statements are created, are published. Um, otherwise, it's the same as the Equality Act, that it will go into a process of not providing a reasonable adjustment um, and what the equality, 
Equality and Human Rights Commission can do around that. But there isn't any financial penalties associated particularly with this regulations. But one of my colleagues says, you know, it's very clear for people who are having problems to refer back to the accessibility statement and show that potentially um, the responsibilities are not being met as they should have, they should be. And I know within universities, there's there's some issues around diversity and inclusion broadly as a measure. I'm assuming this would would signal a, 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 a you know a minus point for that particular area. <laughs> Potentially, Somebody yes. Our office of students this. have been involved. Everybody's aware of these regulations, yeah. and and that's a good thing. You know, from 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 people like Addy and myself who use assistive technology, this is really good because we can see in these statements where we're going to have problems. For me, it's I can't use this form because it, it relies on using a mouse. Uh, for Addy, it's all screen reader compatibility. We know as soon as we see it where the problems will be, but likewise, it's about having that transparency and raising the bar and setting the expectations um there, there's been the last 10 years accessibility statements tend to just have this we are working towards these statements how much use is that you know that that doesn't um help users um so hopefully this move will both help people who rely on assistive technology and personalization um but also raise the bar across the sector cool so that is a whistle-stop tour of the regulations. <laughs> All of the questions you're asking are very good ones, and some of them can be answered, some of them can't. It's also the case that not everything is known at the moment. Uh, that's very clear from doing the prep with Abby for this session. So um, there are a few links that have been suggested in here. We will be providing links. There's some useful links at the end of this session, and also we'll catch up on that and include it in any follow-up materials. What I'd like to do now is just see where everybody feels like they are uh, in terms of the actual process. So I'd like to know... Um, how confident you are about taking the next steps. So we're going to look in a second at what we think the next steps could be um, in terms of things you need to think about. But where do you think you're at? We've got 300 people on this call. It'd be interesting to see what proportion of you have audited your sites and are confident that you will meet all the requirements versus those that have got um, some, you know, somewhere along the line and, not, uh, and looking at what their next steps are because they're in the middle of the process. So... I can see a spelling mistake as well on the poll. I apologize for that. Um, so uh, uh, give it a little moment more. Run that for a minute. So another 15, 20 seconds. If you can see the poll and you just click on the one that feels most like where you're at, it will just give, a, I think, a nice benchmark for what's going to happen over the next few months. I can tell you at the moment that most people have had a few meetings and are starting to think about it. Um, and five people have audited their sites and are confident they will meet all the requirements. Uh, so the naming and shaming doesn't start here. <laughs> <laughs> okay, cool. I'll show you the results there. Um, you'll see pretty much as you might expect that most people are, can you see those, Abby? I'm just checking. Yeah. The, the, so, um, uh, the um, no, uh, 26 of you, 13% said no idea where to start. Uh, 43% with the majority or the largest number is had a few meetings and started thinking about it. Um, some of you started working on the detail but feel overwhelmed. Uh, others have identified priority issues and started addressing them and that might be reflected in the questions because the, some of the questions you're asking here obviously indicate that you've begun puzzling over what you're going to do about some of the thornier ones. And as I say, some people, um, five people say they're, they've audited their sites and are confident they will meet all the requirements which is brilliant obviously that's the goal is that the requirements are uh, uh, are met but equally there are there's a lot of process and other uh, requirements that are needed so we're just going to run through some of the ideas we had about what you could do next um, just to give you a sense of a roadmap um, and uh, we've picked out three suggestions and stepping stones and I'll get Abby to talk to these um, establish your baseline identify some priorities and develop a plan so Abby can you take us through that uh, in terms of step by step yeah i think i mean some of you said you've done audits as well which is really interesting to see that and i think that's quite depends on how big an estate you have um i think that's critical from from point of view is um identifying what parts of your organization are affected or uh, what do you know about the accessibility particularly if you are using third-party systems as well do you have good accessibility information from them um uh, who is responsible for creating content particularly if you have a cms system or an intranet which members of staff might be affecting your accessibility and how much control do you have over that 
built into the systems or in training to them procurement staff again do you have on-site developers do they are they aware of accessibility so there's a there's a definite staff skills area that needs to be done in order to meet these regulations do you know generally how accessible your sites are? Yes, you can go down the audit routes, but there are many ways where you can just quickly find out um, how accessible your site is just on a very quick level. Um, if you've got any members of staff or students or stakeholders with disabilities, it's really good to get them in and have a conversation. Just ask. Um, have you started drafting an accessibility statement? Have you started thinking about the processes that are going to be involved? Do you have somebody who's going to answer the, the emails and the responses to people saying, I've got an accessibility problem? Things like that. There is quite a lot of internal processes that could be impacted by these regulations. And identifying gaps. What are your, where are the gaps within your organisation, both on the digital side and also on the processes side as well? I'm just going to mention a couple of the I'm feeling overwhelmed questions that I can see in the question box. <laughs> um, surely this is a bigger problem. How am I going to do all this? We've got 200 staff and so on. I mean, where you are now obviously is the beginning of this process. And I think it's fair to say that the, the spirit of the regulations is that this is what you seek to yeah. seek to do rather than what you deliver. And I think it's not an, an, an unreasonable for you to feel overwhelmed or to feel that there's so much to get done. I think the next step is really about priorities, isn't it? I think that being clear about internal processes, being clear about what you've got to do by when, but also thinking about how you can bake in accessibility much better in the future than you sort of feel at the moment. Um, and obviously lots of questions apply there, but I think that's about prioritising, isn't it? Absolutely. And again, the conversations we've been having, you know, we don't have a financial penalty related to these regulations and there are good sides of that and there are bad sides of that. Some of us feel, you know, to get that senior management buy-in, to get up there with all the other things that senior managers are being told about, we need to have some penalties associated with this. But this is quite public information that's going out there. But likewise, as a recognition that anything we do with these regulations will make it better for people with disabilities who are using assistive technology than we're at at the moment and the worst thing could be if people start turning off content and systems because they think they can't meet these regulations there is a recognition that even within the regulations that it's not possible to make all content accessible through its exclusions and disproportionate burden exemptions and so this is about having the plan and making it better and incrementing think about what sites have got the most access to what are the most important things for um, for people to um, have access to and, and prioritize in that sense both in systems and in staff training as well but I think you know engaging leadership is difficult it's difficult with any culture change and this is what it's got to be um, and uh, this is a framework um, these regulations that allow us to demonstrate to senior leaders what they should be doing um, but also hopefully by collaborating across the public sector um, um, with similar organizations and other public sectors we can demonstrate that actually setting the bar um, of what we should be expecting within these types of organizations so for example one of the links we have is to a JISC mail email forum that's been set up for further and higher education but it's open to anybody so people outside of education can join in as well and it's a place for discussions and um, myself as a co-chair where there's a group of four of us who chair it we are talking to GDS and government organizations so anything we can communicate backwards and forwards really helps so the next step is as always develop a plan um, I'm a bit on a plan point of view this is a plan but it's also a plan that's got to be forward forever because these regulations aren't going away technology changes all the time accessibility standards get updated as technology changes so you need to always start to have accessibility on the roadmap for any digital projects any content creation as well but also thinking about you're going to have to make a public statement about your compliance with these regulations do you need an audit who's going to sign off that statement to say that they are complying or not with the regulations. Who's going to fix accessibility issues? Often we can create accessibility audits and then people go, but what do I do about it? So do you have staff who are going to have responsibility for improving and fixing and checking as new content comes in? Who's going to be responsible for maintaining that accessibility statement? It is going to have to be updated as you update your website. And some people have said, well, we might have to update it every year. Yeah. So we've got to consider that within our processes. Yes, training staff takes time. Um, embedding accessibility takes time. But there are a few little things like 
word accessibility checker, PowerPoint accessibility checker, people understanding what headings and alt text are, the few little accessibility basics that can really knock off the simple things that can affect um, the experience for people with assistive technology and access needs. But I think key and the thing that can be done uh, without the technical staff is establishing responsibility processes and accountability because without that there's always going to be difficulty with meeting these regulations. And I've put etc on there, Abby, because that's that's not the only thing we discussed when we talked about what might be in a plan. Obviously, we're at, we're at the very foothills of this conversation in lots of ways. So, um, lots of other stuff. I, th I think mm. that's a good set of suggestions, and we just want it to be seen as suggestions, not as um, a tick box exercise. Um, I'm just going to jump over the, the the Derby example. Just I think yeah. it would be useful for you to talk about Kent, but I'd like to get to the to the questions if we can sure. soon. So. Absolutely. So um, this is one of the examples. Um, uh, some of you may know Ben Watson in Kent University. He's been very um, great on his accessibility publicly, both out in the community and in his university. And um, he's got a really great um, example of how to deal with the regulations and also collaboratively. He's working with Kent County Council um, to share expertise and strategy. So as a local community, they're working on accessibility together. Um, they are using their students as interns in the council. So the students are getting accessibility experience um, and developing their skills in a work experience environment. And the council is also benefiting from that. Uh, the university is embedding accessibility and inclusive practice throughout all their staff roles. And they've worked together to produce a draft accessibility statement. And there's a link in the slides to the Google Doc version, so it might still change and this is one of the model statements that um, we've put forward to uh, the government to the cabinet office as a way an accessibility statement might work because we know they're doing examples so if you are thinking about well actually what should I have in my accessibility statement here is um, a working example um, of where two organizations a county council and a university feel they can communicate to users and the technical compliance as well um, but I think that's a great example of how uh, we can all work together in this sector Great, thank you. And I think um, it's well worth reading that draft accessibility statement. And uh, the, the previous example was University of Derby, which has some examples around VLE as well, which people are asking about. But I did want to jump in to try and sure. get some of these questions answered. Um, the first thing is there's a few useful links here. I've seen quite a lot appear in the chat box. Um, somebody just linked there to how to make Excel accessibility accessible, for example. So um, we will be rounding up links that you share with us. If you have any great suggestions, please do pop them into the um, to the chat box for us, uh, because we will share those out afterwards. Um, one, uh, I'm going to highlight two or three here. One is the government accessibility pages. Somebody's linked to this uh, on the gov.uk website. There is a whole um, bunch of resources around this particular legislation. It does lay out the um, the detail that we're talking about, it probably doesn't answer some of the questions you're asking about, does it mean this or does it mean that? It's not at that point yet. So just to be clear, you may not find an answer to some of those questions because it is potentially uh, to be interpreted as we uh, as the deadlines pass. So, Mark, can I just chip in there? We know the government is developing some, con some guidance that will go to organisation leaders as well as technical guidance as well. So right. there is further to come. Cool. Um, JISC Mail, you've mentioned the email list on JISC Mail. There's a link there that can take you through to JISC. You don't have to be a member to join those lists, I understand. Is that right, Abby? No, you don't have to be a member. They're open. The archives are open as well, so you can search them. And for those not in the higher education sector, JISC is um, a, a, an agency that supports universities and higher education institutions for tech with technology. Um, there's a, a GDS advice page is a specific part of that. And then there's something you may not have come across before, which I think we, we are advocates for the International Association for Accessibil of Accessibility Professionals. We're founder members of that. It's a global organization that grew up in the States principally. We, we were founder members with organizations like Microsoft and Adobe and a lot of others. There's several thousand members. There's a, a, a certificate called the Certifi Certified Professional in Accessibility Core Competencies. And for those asking around accessibility skills, because this isn't an area which naturally falls into, oh, you do it like this or you don't do it like that, that's a great place to start. And whether or not you're intending to be an accessibility specialist in your organization, or if you just generally want to know more about how accessibility impacts upon um, your work, then CPAC would be a great place to start. So we recommend having a look at that as, a, as one of your sort of medium term steps potentially. Um, but it will certainly help some of the details fall into place around how you actually get this done. And also you'll understand some of the gray areas where there isn't necessarily a definite um, yes or no answer. 
So uh, we've got some questions. Um, we've got, I'm just looking at the time. Ideally, we'll take no more than about 10 minutes. We'll try and finish by two. Um, and we have a lot of questions in here. Some of them have been answered. Um, Abby, I don't know if you've got anything in there that jumps out at you. I've got um, something I was going to ask Addy, but um, uh, do you um, do you have anything in there that you can see straight away? Are the top um, of the list that I've voted yeah, about? I, I, th- really? I think there's a, I've just been skimming through. There's a few about captions and images and graphs and complex of how much do I have to do this. Um, and I think the thing is with this is it's about a risk assessment. It's really great that you're aware of those accessibility potential issues um, for example people are asking about automated captions on youtube versus you know full accurate captions and it's about deciding you know, at least having some captions is better than nothing because it can help people who just might need some support with understanding speech but do you have an accessible alternative for those who may need further support what is the process for them getting a transcript or, or, or more accurate captions particularly if you're working with internal staff um, or stakeholders to students, you should be already having a process to support them. Um, so going through that process as well. In terms of images and image descriptions, likewise, it's about thinking through that process of does this image need to be described? How can it be described? Am I already providing an accessible alternative? And are people aware of how to get that as well? Um, in terms of uh, there's a few questions around um, penalties and am I covered as well? I think, you know, please do ask the questions. Please do either through GISC mail or by email or by contacting the government because we're all in this together to get clarity as well. But in terms of going back, you know, the Equality Act is still there, even if you're not sure if the regulations do cover you. Um, so you need to be aware that... Um, even if specifically under the regulations you're not covered, you are covered by the Equality Acts. I'm just going to ask um, uh, Addy, um, um, in your experience, um, we were talking about live captioning earlier. How, how accurate does it have to be before it's useful, do you think? That's one of the questions here. Uh, we're, we're at sort of 60, 70%. Somebody, I'm just trying to find the question. Somebody suggested 60 to 70%. I think as, um, as Abby mentioned, I mean, it's, um, obviously this, the something is better than 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 nothing, um, and and obviously if it's if it's um, if if it's a course or a video or, or a piece of material that is in the, you know there's a lot of demand for it for people who are, for example, deaf, then you know that might be uh, a resource you, you you might want to get a more accurate captioning for as opposed to doing it for, for everything if the budget doesn't permit. Cool. And in, and in practical terms, um, we're using a paid-for service to have live captions today. We wouldn't uh, do that for anything other than our webinars. We do them infrequently, um, and that, may, that, that isn't necessarily going to be the right answer for you in terms of you know, routine production of video. Um, transcripts uh, we use as, a, as an accessibility feature, so you can upload them. YouTube will provide automated ones. They're not great, but they can be edited. And we do sometimes pay for transcripts or for subtitling uh, through services that you can get online. Um, those are the things we know about. Obviously, the robot-driven ones, the AI ones um, that are built into PowerPoint and, and Zoom, the software we're using here, had some as well. They're 60 to 70%. You can follow some of it. What we've noticed when we're using it is it, it depends on the person speaking and how clearly they speak. Um, as to just how f- how much you can even follow anything on it. it, it it obviously produces gobbledygook. Anybody who's followed the news, trying to follow the news on the TV by watching the subtitles, will know that sometimes it makes sense and sometimes it doesn't. And uh, hopefully, they're getting better. They will get better. You assume they will, but th- I, I think that just shows that we're in the middle of that time at the moment when people are deciding what's the best thing for us to do. Where's our priorities here? Is it to try and provide? fully accessible captioned uh, live video content for every single thing we do, or can we see some areas where we were better putting our focus first? Um, and certainly that's the spirit of the regulations. It isn't that everybody suddenly jumps to a new standard, <clears throat> but at least there's a much greater awareness of the standard and much greater awareness that um, this needs to be resolved. For, otherwise we're excluding students. There are people who can't attend or participate in courses and, and the benefits of a higher education because of these systems so that's the purpose of this 
I think it's also about considering the purpose of using video as well. Um, if you are putting video up on YouTube, the tools are there to edit the captions, as you say, to make sure people are trained and aware on it. But if you're using a video within a teaching context, then the lecturer should be aware already whether there are people in the room who may have difficulties and be thinking about the purpose of why they are using a video and can, that might not suit every student that's in the room even if they haven't got a disability and how they're going to support them. So it's a general awareness of the limitations of any media, whether it's text, images or video. Um, and in a, a teaching context, there's a universal design for learning model as well, um, which, which allows people to understand how different forms of hmm. media uh, and expression can affect different groups of students. So um, it's not about running away from you must have a, you know, 100% captions on everything but if you've got a choice of three videos in teaching choose the one with captions don't choose the ones without captions yeah. as well it's it's those types of discussions um i've got a question here um I've, Addy or, or, or abby i think Addy, you may know a bit of that um is the current best practice that the accessibility tools are delivered client side from the user's browser or user's device tools the thing they've particularly mentioned is recite me so i um, i think the question is whether or not tools like recite me and browse aloud and those other plugins that you can put on your website, do they provide sufficient sort of accessibility options um, or uh, are there other things you would need to resolve anyway? Because those are paid for things often. I think for different, um, different, different users. So for example, browse aloud would be helpful for someone who is dyslexic, say, or doesn't have English as their first language. Um, regardless of Browse Aloud being on the website, the website still needs to be accessible. So you could have Browse Aloud on a website that's not accessible, say to someone using uh, a screen reader. So you have to come back to, you know, just, just, just it's just different, providing different options. Yeah. Um, I guess in understanding what needs that, 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 that would mean. Absolutely, those plugins only deal with certain problems. Browse Aloud can be there, it can help me read the content on the screen, but it doesn't help me get into an inaccessible date picker on a form. It doesn't help me change the colors and do other things. So, um, and, and often there's issues with people installing those plugins as well. The, the accessibility standards allow people to use their own assistive technology, which is set up for them. Uh, it allows them to personalize the site, change the font size, zoom. It's not just about having a read button on the page. Great, thank you. And I think that uh, equally, I can hear some of these things. Some of the questions are, you know, will this do this? Then often there are choices between different pieces of software. Some softwares will have, software will have strengths and weaknesses. Some will cost more than others. That's the point where you're digging into your plan a bit and looking at the priorities and deciding how much you're going to dig into that particular question versus another. And there are various knowledge. I mean, there's so much information being shared on the chat box here about where to look for help. This is where um, you need to start thinking about what questions do you have and how are you going to answer them rather than, you know, we won't necessarily have a, a yes, no answer anyway, um, any more than anyone else would. We may have tried something and can recommend it, but um, there will be other options. And, I think if you start with what's the scope of this for you, how much have you got to try and resolve, um, then you see the statement as a sort of a position that you're going to reach by the 23rd of September, not the end point, but being clear that on that date, you're going to tell people where you've got to and what you're working on. It's almost like a gap analysis in a way, yeah. you know, and, and it's not, a, it's, it's, it's like, yeah, it's, and it's like a statement to show what you've tried, where you're at. It's like, you just, you know, you put your hands up saying, this is where we've got to, <laughs> you know, we can't put captions on everything at the moment. It's just not possible, but at least, you know, it gives you a bit of clarity where you're at. And also as a disabled student, you know, if I was at university, I could go into the page and see, hmm, that's what they're working on. And, and if, you know, if certain disabilities, certain students have certain needs that haven't really been prioritized on the, um, on the statement, then at least they know how to get in touch and, and flag that up. Yeah. I think I would I would say um, in terms of generally I've actually I put my tw tweet handle on the chat pane and if there's questions people haven't had a chance to answer I can pick them up on Twitter after um, people say how if you're thinking how am I ever going to meet this how am I going to do this um, well actually 
in the US, a lot of colleges have had to meet certain similar standards for years. We know it's possible within a university context. Um, there are countries such as Australia and Norway, as well as the US, that require all federal government organizations and some businesses as well to meet these standards. Um, and, uh, you know, there are pages and we can provide information if you feel that that helps for your senior leadership to understand. Um, this isn't an impossible hurdle to meet. Um, but it's not something that necessarily you can meet straight away. It's also worth mentioning the IAAP thing I said, the International Association, has a huge HE network within it. Um, and that's one reason, if none other, for some of you on this um, webinar to, to take a look at IAAP because the HE specialisms in there that have grown out of the US are really quite specific and will answer some of the questions you have here quicker and better than anything that we could do as non-specialists in that space. So um, the IAAP, the professionalization of accessibility is something that's happening around us. We're obviously pleased about that because it promotes the accessible um, internet that, we're, that we want to, to see for everybody. Um, but the professionalization is probably something that's going to come uh, sooner rather than later, I think, in terms of digital skills. So take a look at the IAAP um, and, and have a look at the HE stuff in particular, if that's your current background. Um, right, I'm going to draw it to a close. There is clearly a huge long list of questions that we haven't answered, couldn't answer, didn't even get to. Um, we'll do our best to provide some information in the, in the follow-up. Um, in terms of what we do and how we can help, we will do more webinars. There will be some paid-for and free training and events that you could attend. TechShare Pro in November will have, um, uh, have a stream about this topic. We're going to be looking at pulling it together because it's such a key area. Um, and um, we also can offer you, offer you, offer you services. We um, earn income from selling our services. So if you need any help with testing or um, accessibility checking or expert reviews of your information, that's the type of stuff we can do. Take a look on our website and speak to our experts and, and see if we can help you. Uh, we publish news and information around accessibility all the time. It's on our website, but it's also particularly in our newsletter. So if you're not on our mailing list, then please do take a look at that. Um, and then finally, you're going to be linked through to a feedback form. We'll send you a link to that form as well. We really would like to know what your questions are that we could answer in the future. There's loads on the question and answer box here, obviously. I've got 63 questions that we've asked today. <laughs> That's by far a record for our webinars. We know you've got loads of questions. We know we're here to try and help. So, but please do use the feedback form as much as you can to try and clarify how you think we could help you in your next steps. And um, we will be back. We'll be doing some more of this. So uh, please do keep asking us questions and asking for help. I'd like to say a huge thank you to Abby and to Addy for their support uh, and expertise and insights as ever. And to Orla, who's been tapping away very accurately providing us with a really good <laughs> transcript of what we've been saying. And thank you to you for coming. Um, we had over 500 people sign up for this webinar. It's a hugely popular and important topic. And I'm no doubt we'll be doing some more stuff around this very soon. So thank you all and uh, uh, good luck. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Bye.